All right, so I think we're streaming now. It'll take 20 seconds for this thing to buffer. Um, so we're going to start up again in Chapter 9, and I think we're on about page... Whoops, lost it here. Let me get it back up. Uh, 34, about page 34. Let me hit that button and hit this button. We'll do this there. And let's start with a screen share. Okay, where's my mouse? There it is. Okay, there's that. <clears throat> okay, and so I think I said page 34. There we go. So last time we started momentum problems and I briefly alluded to uh, the types of collisions and I guess I include explosions as basically a collision played in reverse. So um, when I say collisions, I mean collisions, explosions, basically two objects hitting or two objects separating. All right. So a quick review of the names, just so you get it. Elastic is the first one I would remember. Bouncy, elastic, rubber bands, think energy is conserved. Springs conserve energy. Springs are bouncy. So this is a special type of collision. Uh, and now that could be two objects that hit when, they're, uh, when they've got springs on top of them or rubber bands, or it could be uh, two pool balls or steel balls actually uh, impacting each other are very elastic, okay? So um, that means no energy is lost. Great. Uh, perfectly inelastic means the objects stick together and move together in unison. Most real life collisions don't fit either of those. They are imperfectly bouncy. The objects bounce off, but they lose some energy. Okay. And so those are your three main types of collisions you're going to see in a textbook. There's elastic, inelastic, and then perfectly inelastic. That's where they stick together. Um, there's also explosions. That's where you start with one object and it splits into multiple. Usually energy is not conserved unless something in the problem indicates it's elastic, like uh, if the blocks were pushed apart by springs or magnets or something that conserves energy. So um, there's a couple of examples of this weird type of problem referenced here. Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe let's take a look here. Um, let's just start with this one. Okay. So a cart, uh, we're looking at 9.6. I'll let you kind of take a look at this while I get it sketched out. All right. Just drawing the same pictures you have there. You can get it on your paper too. <clears throat> All right. First up, what type of collision is this from the previous page? Perfectly inelastic. Yeah, this is a perfectly, this is this perfect case. So if you're wondering what that looks like, here it is. This is perfectly inelastic. They stick together and move in unison after the collision. Got it. Perfectly inelastic. So now let's do this together. I'm going to show you my whiteboard in just a second. So we're going to determine the final speed after the collision. Now remember, one of the things that we always have to think about in momentum problems, I'm just going to remind you right now, strictly speaking, momentum is mass times velocity. However, in this particular problem, I just want to point out everything is moving to the right. 
So for this particular problem, we could probably use velocity and speed interchangeably. In general, that's a bad idea. So I'm probably going to be very strict here and use velocity the whole time, just because, uh, and now remember to get final speed, we could always take the absolute value at the end, the magnitude of the final uh, velocity. That said, let's go ahead and do it. And uh, if you're wondering what procedure I'm gonna follow, from this point on, if you want to race ahead without me, the procedure I'm going to follow is actually at the bottom of page 32. The procedure I'm going to follow is at the bottom of page 32. And I'm just going to do it if you want to have that to reference. Okay, let's get to the whiteboard. Let's get the speaker view. Let's get me up there. All right. So we've got these blocks. Oops, I just lost a marker. Notice the things that I'm doing, I'm drawing, ah, oh, come on. I've got a before and an after picture and I dropped a marker. All right. Now we are going to assume momentum is conserved. Why is that okay? Let's, before we do it, is it okay? External forces, whoops, are negligible. That's my claim, all right? If that's true, so I should say if external forces are negligible, then we could use P initial of the system, not just one, of the system equals P final of the system. That's our goal. Do you think it's reasonable to say the external forces are negligible? Anybody? Yes. Okay, and what's your thinking? Um, here it says uh, friction is negligible. Sweet. What about gravity? Isn't that an external force? Um, they're no. moving in separate directions, right? So it doesn't matter mm, no. for gravity? No. Gravity is an external force pulling down on these blocks. Is it because it's perpendicular? it's because it's balanced by the normal force in this case, oh. right? So normal force is another external force. However, do you agree the up and down force is balance here? So there's no net external force. So that's why it's okay. If we have negligible friction, we don't have to worry about forces left, right. If we don't have any forces up and down net, this is valid. Is that cool? Does that make sense why it's negligible? I hope so. All right, all right, so this is valid. Now, I know I'm gonna run out of room on the whiteboard, so I'm just gonna move this up. So we discussed, is conservation momentum valid? Yes, because external forces are negligible. So it's okay to say P initial equals P final. Now I'm just gonna do this one level up. This, we should say that's P1 initial plus P2 initial should equal P1 final plus P2 final, right? So I'm just gonna walk you through every little step. At any time, if I'm losing you, just say, dude, I don't get it, or say something, okay? Unmute, okay? So, so far, all I'm doing is I'm saying, look, the initial momentum should be from both of them. Final momentum should be both, both of them. Now I'm gonna go one step further. In this case, I don't need to worry about Y direction. So I'm gonna simplify this by saying P one initial in the X plus P two initial in the X should equal P one final in the X whew, plus P two final X. Now notice, you notice I dropped the vectors. That's because just like in chapter two, we could have put an I hat here on every single term. However, if it appears on every single term, we then immediately cancel it. And so we don't need to write it, but that's, this is still a vector equation. So notice what is important here. This problem doesn't matter, but the next one it might. Here, remember there's an I hat secretly implied on all of these. So if anything is going to the left, you need a negative sign. 
Again, because there's an I hat implied on each term here, anything going left should have a minus sign in it. That's kind of a subtle thing that's tricky. All right, so now we're almost there. Mass one, V one initial X plus mass two, V two initial X equals, aha, we can actually say both of these have the same final speed. So I could do this, mass one plus mass two equals V final X. Again, this is not always true. It's true for perfectly inelastic collisions. What do I mean by that? If the two objects collide and stick together, only then do they have the same final velocity. Only then can you do this. Otherwise, it'd look a lot like this side. Okay. Now we have an equation we can work with. We have masses and speeds. This is something we could work with. We've accounted for the minus signs. This should be positive. This, well, what is this term in this case? Zero. 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 This one, V2 initial X equals zero. So generally speaking, that's one of the first things we do is plug in the zeros. Had we done that right here, we would have saved a lot of writing, right? So generally speaking, if you know something zero, you plug it in right away. Okay. Now at this point, I believe we're supposed to solve for V final X, right? In this case, we've already accounted for the plus minus signs. So notice in this equation, Listen carefully. We started from a vector equation up here. If we manually put in the minus signs here, these Vs become speeds. And again, think carefully. You either put a plus or minus number out front and you have mass times speed. The minus sign accounts for the velocity, the direction. It's very subtle. I'm saying it one more time. Because we're gonna manually put in plus or minus signs out here based on the pictures, these Vs actually represent speeds. Now, if you don't put in any minus signs and you only put in the minus signs when you plug in numbers, that would be a different story. All right, whatever. So out of this, I think we get V final X equals, it's gonna be this thing divided by that. Okay, like this. Now notice in this particular problem, we were told the initial velocity of one was V. So this became V and all I did was just do a little algebra. This is the answer to part B. Questions on that? Makes sense. Let's bring up the screen, see if there's anything I forgot, okay? Okay, got it. I think that, and so if the minus signs are the only thing that's going to get you in this chapter, people, that's, I don't know if you've noticed, I've been spending a lot of time saying, watch out, watch out, watch out. You forget one minus sign out of four, you miss the whole problem for a freaking minus sign, even though you did all the algebra and physics thinking correctly. So it's really important to pay attention to details. Those minus signs matter. All right. Determine the percent change in energy. All right, so let's do this on the board. And uh, I'm going to write this up top so I have some room. So just give me a sec. By the way, normally you just start from this equation. You don't do all this work because you get so fast at these. You're like, oh, <laughs> write this down. And then it's like a one line problem. So eventually you're going to get good. I hope that made sense where it came from, though. So let me write this up here. The answer to part B was... V final in the X was equal to M1 over the total mass times V. Well, I guess before we go on, we should check a couple of things. What's one thing we should always check? Units. Units. Does this have the right units? This is meters per second. What are the units of this thing out front? Meters, but they'll all cancel out. Uh, not meters. Kilograms. Yeah, it's kilograms. kilograms 
over kilograms plus kilograms, which is kilograms. So kilograms over kilogram. You're right. It cancels out. I think I knew what you meant, but yeah, you, you said it. So notice this is kind of cool. Could we have used grams? No matter what units you use for mass, this works out. This is a classic physics trick. Remember, in our, when we're writing our algebraic expressions, something with no units times something with the correct units. That's why it's split up this way. Meters per second looks good. What else? You tell me. If this block smashes into this one, should it get faster or slower? Use your, use your experience in the world. What do you think? No. Slower. Er. Is this going to be slower? Is the final speed less than the initial speed in this case? Yes. Yeah, because it's like three over six or something like that. So it's, yeah. All right, we see this makes sense. All right, now we can move on. We're feeling pretty good. The units check out. The number seems to make sense in that it should be a smaller speed after an impact with an at rest. Okay, good. So percent delta K. That's equal to K final minus K initial all over K initial times 100%, which is one, but that's percent change in kinetic energy. You could do this a lot of different ways. One thing you could do is you could actually instantly modify it to make it less work by saying that's K final over K initial minus one times 100%. Do you agree with that? Does that make sense? I take both terms and divide by K initial. K initial over K initial gives me the negative one. Either way will work. Now, this is your first time doing this, so I'm gonna actually work it all the way out. I don't normally spend so much time in the details. But I want to show you some neat tricks and just kind of the pattern that these types of things happen, have. Once you see the pattern for this percent change in energy, it's a very common computation. You'll see a pattern. And I think hopefully uh, as we do this several times throughout the rest of the semester, uh, it'll be easier. So again, I'm going to rewrite this one as K final over K initial minus one times 100%. Okay, so in this case, the final kinetic energy, what's the equation for kinetic energy? Remind me. One half, half. mv squared. Okay, so it's one half mass. Uh, in this case, it's going to be mass one plus mass two times v final squared, right? That's the final kinetic energy. In this case, the initial was this one. Let's pause and see if that makes sense. All I did was I just dumped in a bunch of crap. Does anything simplify here? <clears throat> Can we drop anything out? The one half on the numerator and denominator. Yep. And so one of the things that you're going to find is you, you're going to, you may even stop writing the one halves in this equation because they always cancel out. So that's, you get faster at this later. You learn tricks. The one halves always cancel out. Does anything else cancel out? Um, I don't think so. Let me rephrase. I can tell the V's are going to cancel out if we do something special. Look at this. Isn't this V final related to that V? So if we take this and shove it in right there, 
this is the step you probably wouldn't have seen. If we take this crap and shove it in right there, the V's will cancel as well. Now, do you see it? <clears throat> yeah. And that is a step that you, now that you know that trick, you're like, oh, just remember that. Usually what you do in these problems is you do a momentum problem, find a speed, then we can plug that speed into the percent change in kinetic energy and you get something dropping out. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in and do this. Now I'm going to need some more room. So I'm going to scoot this back a bit, lower this down. So I'm plugging that in, okay? Equals M1 plus M2 divided by M1 V squared. And then there's this thing, right? That thing was, sheesh, M1 over M1 plus M2 V quantity squared. Let me scoot that back in so you can see it. So all I did was I take that and I shove it in right there. So far, so good. And I should be careful here. It's this thing was in parentheses. You see that right there? That was the total mass. So I'm just going to make sure you can see that better. Sorry about that. Do you see anything else that's going to cancel out? Some yeah. of this junk, right? How about I just yeah. say it that way? Some of that junk. So now check this out. I'm going to just cheat a little bit. I'm going to put a parenthesis right here and square that and then write V squared. So all I did was I squared this and squared that. Now... I could see that the V squareds, both of them cancel out. One of the M1s and one of the M1 plus M2s cancel out. And I forgot there's a minus one from right here. Let me make that stand out. There was a minus one right here. So let's keep that minus one. All this junk times 100%. Oh my gosh, this is getting messy. Let's go down just a little bit here. So now what do we get? Woof. M1 over M1 plus M2. Then we had the minus one. And there was all this times 100%, right? Can we simplify this? You could, uh, I mean, multiply one by the denominator. Yes, good. Common denominator. So take a look. Let's common denom this. Nice job. Sorry, that's so sloppy. So I got it. That's supposed to be an M1 plus M2. So now what do I get left on the numerator? Right, so all I did was, right, to make this one, it's just M1 plus M2 over M1, that's still one. Now I've got the common denominator. What's left just, in the numerator? You just get an M2. No. Wait. Negative M2? Negative M2, right? Watch out. That is the percent Delta K. Is that all on the board? Yeah, I hope you could see that. Sorry, it's a little sloppy writing upside down and backwards. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Should we be getting a negative number here? What does this mean to get a negative percent Delta K? Are you We're losing speed or losing energy? Not speed. Are you gaining or losing energy? Losing energy. Does that seem reasonable based off this picture that we described? 
Yes. Yeah. If you smash into something, you're probably going to lose energy. Something that, uh, and now Esteban mentioned speed, right? Typically, if the objects lose speed, and we know energy is proportional to speed squared, usually that term dominates. And yes, if you lose speed, you typically lose energy, but that's not necessarily true. Are you cool with that, Esteban? Yeah. So we got to be very careful. Usually when you lose speed, you lose energy. What if you lost 10% of your speed while simultaneously gaining 600,000% of your mass? that it's right. You might actually be gaining energy. Like imagine you're an asteroid out in space and dust particles keep getting hit onto you and you gain mass uh, at the same time as you slow down a little bit. If you gain more mass than you lose speed, it's possible you could actually gain energy. I don't know. It'd be complicated, but usually as you lose, yeah, usually as you lose speed, you lose energy. Here's a weird one in the upper atmosphere there's a tiny amount of drag, right? Normally air resistance, you would think slows you down, right? But typically in the upper atmosphere, if you encounter atmospheric resistance that lowers your orbit and speeds you up. So drag can speed you up sometimes. There's, yeah, I, yeah, there's weird exceptions for a lot of stuff. So, but okay, enough on that. Generally speaking, as you lose speed, you typically lose energy, enough said. Not always. Whew. All right. Um, let's see. I think we answered that problem. I'm just going back to look at it now. Whoops. This is, this is kind of the, the tricks that you see a lot with this type of problem here. All right. Um, okay. And so notice I mentioned, let's, I say, fill in the table below. So let me get back. Let me get back the screenshot just so we're all seeing the same thing at the same time. So now that we have that result, you could actually very quickly plug in all these things and see what happens. And now just to save you some time, let's go look at it. Whoops. Uh, solution to nine, 9.6. There they are. Now look at this. Let's see if this makes some kind of intuitive sense to you. Okay, and just if it helps, I'm gonna have the picture up here on screen. I'm gonna draw it right next to this, right? So the idea in this case, we had object one that was initially moving with some speed V. And then we had object two initially at rest. All right, now, and then what we said is they stick together and form one mega object. We'll call it one plus two. And it was going to slide off this way at V final. That was the pictures that we kind of discussed. So now in this case, let's start with they weigh the same amount. They have equal mass. I hope this makes sense. If you, if you conserve momentum, you need to lose half of your speed if you double your mass, right? So initially, this one had no momentum. P2 initial was equal to zero. P1 initial was equal to MV. Or we'll call it M1V, all right, just so we can keep track. So the idea was, if you start out, your initial momentum is MV, and momentum is conserved, your final momentum has to be MV. Well, look at this. If I make a column here of momentum, P final, right? That's 2m times half v. We get the same, and I know I'm going a little slow on this one. I won't always go this slow, but notice your final momentum is still mv. We started with mv, we end with mv. Notice in this one, what's our initial momentum if we start with 3m in the second line? three M times V, our momentum is three MV, right? Well, three fourths times four M, I end up with three MV final. Now check this out. 
if you have a heavy object moving and it slams into a light object, you only lose 25%. Take this to the absurd limit of a school bus slamming into a mosquito. That's like a huge mass hitting almost no mass. We'd expect that your loss of energy from impacting a mosquito should be negligible. Aha. What if we take it the other way? What if you have a mosquito slamming into a stationary school bus? You lose almost all of your energy. The same reasons. That, and right, notice in this case, our initial momentum was MV. Our final momentum is still MV. All right. Um, I have no idea if this is helping or if you're confused. This is a good time for questions. Any questions? It's kind of just a bunch of algebra, right? Keep you track and of those minus. Oh, go ahead. We're, we're focusing on uh, the inelastic right now. This was not just or, an inelastic. What type was perfectly. this? Perfectly inelastic. Absolutely. So far, so okay. good. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, let's go back to this one now. So this 9.6 was perfectly inelastic. Let's go to, whoops, let's go to this one, 9.7. Magnets were placed between the cart. They never actually touch. Friction is negligible. What type of collision is 9.7? Elastic. This is elastic. What equations can we write down for an elastic? By the way, it's these magnets, so they never actually touch. If they never actually touch, the magnets conserve energy. Whoops, I just told you what equation we could write down. What's one equation we could write down? Whoops. Changing kinetic energy would be zero. Yeah. So now, how many total equations can we write? We could say K initial equals K final. That's true for a special elastic collision. What's the other equation we could write down for every collision? Conservation of. <laughs> Momentum, all right, whatever. Sorry, you guys probably didn't realize I was waiting for you to chime in. We have two conservation equations. This is conservation of energy up top. This is conservation of momentum down low. Same idea, you could do this one at home. Hey, quick question. Can you help me with part C? What's the percent change in energy? Zero. zero. Yeah, it's zero, right? <laughs> that was a trick question. All right, so now we've seen, oh, and I guess I should have said this was elastic. I started writing and got distracted. So we say that's elastic, right? Okay, so far so good on that. Now, let me, uh, whoops, I'm gonna let you work on that one at home. Ah, hold on. There's that one. Let's try this one. I'm doing them a little out of order, but it doesn't matter. Take a look at 9.4. So I'm going to give you a second to read that. Where, what kind of collision do you think this one is? And let's go through them one at a time. Is it perfectly inelastic? No. No. It's elastic. Is it elastic? Yes. No. no. It's inelastic. It, this is an inelastic. This is the case where they bounce off each other 
but it's I could tell because it says, where did the lost energy go? So some energy is lost. Sneaky, right? So here's the deal. This is a lot like the static friction case. Nothing in here implies that energy is conserved. Nothing says the right. Nothing says the collision was done with springs or rubber bands or magnets. No, there's no mention of the word elastic anywhere. So we cannot assume that it is elastic. It might be elastic. It might not be. How do you know? What you do is first we do conservation of momentum. We have a bunch of parameters here. Then you can look at the change in energy. If the change in energy is zero, it was elastic. And so if the change in energy wasn't zero, we can't assume that. Um, is that clear why it's not elastic? Yeah. It, it's, it's unclear and it's deliberately unclear. And so if it is unclear, we cannot assume it's elastic. And that's what I wanted you to know. Elastic is such a special condition. You can only assume it if something in the problem tells you that. That's enough on that, I hope. Um, cool. So you could do this one at home. Now, um, let me see if I have this here. Give me just a sec. I have some videos. Let me, I don't know. I don't want to spend all day on the videos because I spent a lot of time last time. This is not what I wanted. This is, maybe it's this one. Is it it's this one? Let me open up a new window. Go to YouTube here. Sorry, I'm just getting some files open. I thought I had the right channel open. I had the wrong channel open. Almost there. Almost there. I think I could do it now. All right. So um, maybe what I'll do is just so you can... Look at this. I'm going to get put the chapter nine playlist in the um, in the chat. And so you could see there's a lot of videos I made here. Um, I made so many different versions of these things. So I did some elastic collisions. For these ones, we could just watch a random one, let's say. So in this case, maybe. So I have some different spheres, and the idea here is, I don't know if you could see it, but this has got a spring in it, and there's going to be a ball inside of here. There's a, a string here and a ball hanging on the string, and so I have two metal spheres, and they're going to smash into each other, and like a brass sphere or a steel sphere impacting the other one, there's going to be negligible loss of energy. There's a little bit. So let's just run this one and take a look at it. So this would be two metal spheres impacting is very elastic. Um, let me get it plain. Let me make it full screen. Oh, I guess I used a plastic ball for this case. And let me, let me just slow it down a little bit so it buffers better. So in this case... Okay, so... Here it goes. Two, three. <laughs> now, I know this seems a little bit silly there, but if I could, I'm gonna back this up. I don't know if you could tell right now, but the, the two balls hit each other and then notice the string swings up to an angle of about there or something, maybe. I'm just going to kind of really be sloppy. But the idea here is you could actually use the momentum problem that we just did and talk about one that was initially moving, hitting one that was at rest, and you could calculate the momentum. And then you could do an energy problem. Remember, we know an energy problem. So think about this. You could do a stage here where this thing is moving with speed V final. How do we get V final? Well, we did a momentum problem where we had V1 was moving with speed V, hits this ball that was at rest, and then you say, okay, well, then it was 
uh, an elastic collision, I think, and this one was moving off this way with some speed something V final, and this one was also moving with some speed V final, whatever. So V final one and V final two, this was V one initial. Then we could use this V final two, and it's gonna swing up to some max angle here, theta. You could in theory start putting together momentum and energy problems, and this is called a ballistic pendulum. Actually, we often run it in reverse. We know the angle, so that helps us figure out the initial speed of the ball. We know the masses of the balls, so then we can figure out the speed of this one. And you could figure out how fast a bullet comes out of a gun this way. So when I was a kid in school at your age, they brought in a 22 and were shooting rifles in class and we were measuring the blocks as they they'd shoot a rifle into a block of wood in school. Times have changed. We're not doing that anymore for obvious reasons. Old school, man, old school. All right, um, I don't know. I'm gonna pause there. Any questions on that kind of stuff? Let me get out of this. I'll let you, I'm gonna give you all of this crap. I doubt you're gonna watch much of these, but if you're trying to get a feeling for these kinds of collisions, you can see that there's a lot of elastic. Here's some inelastic. Um, there's some explosions. Um, and there's data, there's all this stuff here. Uh, so I'm just gonna kind of leave it at that. Let me- um, So I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So when you play pool, right? Yes. And there's times where you hit, you hit the, you hit the ball. ball, the cue ball. Head on. And, uh, or and the, or yeah, the, and yeah. They, they, they travel together. And there's times where the cue ball stays in place in the other ball. So what, what uh, I yes. guess my question, I guess my question is when, when the, uh, the object moving hits the stationary object and stays put and the only the, the stationary object moves, what, what would that be considered? So there are several unusual scenarios that can happen. In, it turns out for, for two different masses with an elastic collision. So I'm gonna get back to our elastic collision. You are talking about two pool balls, uh, whoops, elastic. So two pool balls, lose negligible energy when they collide. I hope you're okay with that, yeah. right? They don't, um, now you might not think of them as springs, but actually they flex a tiny amount, but then that flex is almost immediately restored. And so it's like a perfect spring that's super stiff and barely flexes at all. That's why steel is also a good one. So you are looking at this type of scenario. So 9.7, I'm going to show you something in the solution to 9.7, if I could find it. So here's the mess. Now, um, look at 9.7, whoa. This is, uh, okay. I think you should actually use the solutions for 9.7. If you try to do 9.7 without the solutions, it is a slog, slog. So um, when you're doing 9.7, do yourself a favor and actually follow my algebra, please. Now, when you do all this junk, we get these answers here. Now, Esteban just asked a question, and I think I, you were asking about this. Look at this crazy scenario. Again, if you have two equal mass objects, so remember, in this problem, we had one going towards two that is at rest. That's one special case, okay? And then we said it's elastic. That's another special thing about this one. So we had initial object two at rest. And if they both have exactly the same mass, the velocity actually goes completely over to the other one. We say the cue ball stops and the other one goes on. This only happens if it's a one dimensional collision. If you hit it dead on, if there's any kind of angle, this scenario doesn't apply. It's not 1D, it's 2D. That's a different problem. Is that helping, Esteban? Okay, that makes sense. So try this. If you play pool next time, try, just put another ball out there and try your best to hit it perfectly dead on. The cue ball should stop. Now, what happens if you accidentally give the cue ball spin? Then it has angular momentum. That's another challenge to, that. then there's something else that has to be conserved that changes the problem. If you hit it at an angle, well, we know both balls go in. 
And think about the classic where the, the cue ball is on one spot and the, the ball that you're hitting has just been taken out because somebody scratched and they put it on the other spot. If you impact it, you know the two balls are going to split right at that 45 degree angle, right? So I'm talking about this scenario. You have a cue ball here or whatever, and then there's a pocket here, and then there's a pocket here. The idea is if you try to hit this perfectly, well, you need to give this one this amount of momentum because they have the same mass, you have to give the other one the same amount of momentum the other way. Otherwise, momentum is not conserved. Initially, there was zero momentum left, right, right? And so at the end, however much momentum you give to one ball must be the same as the momentum of the other ball. That's why you always scratch. All right, whatever. Enough on that. Is that good on the cue balls? And, yeah, and the yeah, pool? yeah, that was pretty cool. Thank you. So if you're really crazy, I know this is really really old school watch donald duck in math land i know that sounds crazy but this is the kind of stuff i checked that video out from the library when i was a kid on vhs cassette i didn't have beta so i had to check it out on vhs is it math math magic land uh maybe it's like donald duck in math magic land or something like that and and if you're really crazy you could watch uh um, the Power of the Atom. It's an old, old Disney movie where they have a thousand mousetraps set up or something. Uh, the, yeah, that's like explaining nuclear bombs to kids. It's, I love that old stuff. It's so weird. All right, anyways, I should get back to content. All right, let's pause for a second. Um, how's everybody doing on this stuff? So far, kind of getting a little bit better at it. So we haven't really gone over if the secondary object is in motion. Is that what yeah, gonna... that's, that's next. So let's take a look, right? So we're starting simple and building it up. Everything, we could stop right now and you should be able to figure it all out. But boy, it sure helps to have some worked examples, right? So why don't we do a couple more? Um, so uh, here's another one. This is a crazy one to do. Um, this is a variation on the ballistic pendulum that we just talked about so that we don't have to think about angles. What you could do is you could shoot a bullet into a block just like this. And notice we get this same scenario. This shows you how much energy you lose. If you know the height of the bullet, you could back calibrate and figure out the speed of the bullet. All right, this is, a, this is another example where one of them's initially at rest. Normally I do this in class, but I don't have all the equipment to spread it all out. So if you want to kind of go through this one, it's a pretty good one to learn from. There, those are all very similar to what we just did. Here's one where the bullet's moving afterwards. Let's get down here. Here's one. Here's one where they're both moving. So um, this is a cool one. So let's look at, let's look at this one, 9.11, all right? So what happens if you have two objects moving now? And I think that was your question. Nine point seven. That one I talked about is probably the most tedious problem in this entire class. It's the most algebra slogginess. So once you get through that one, all the rest of them are are bad. But they're not. If you could do nine point seven, you can handle all the algebra in this class. I think that's a very clever problem. All right. That said, we're doing nine one one. We've got a truck. We've got a car. Okay. And so maybe we'll say this is Notice we still haven't done anything moving to the left. All you got to do with stuff moving to the left or moving downwards is stick in minus signs, all right? But let's, let's ignore the minus signs for right now. Okay, they collide, they stick together. What type of collision? Perfectly in an, an elastic. Perf in, yep. I'll say perf in elastic. That's good, that's good enough. Okay, perfectly inelastic. Okay, so now 
what are we supposed to do? Get components. Ah, oh, okay. So, all right. So we got to, let's just look at this one. Okay. All right, here we go. So afterwards, this thing's going to be one mega blob. One plus two. Now just, you could tell in this problem, it's pretty easy. If this one's moving up and that one's moving to the right, which way should this thing be moving? Approximately. Diagonally to the right. Some no. kind of some kind of here. Should it be closer to the x-axis or closer to the y-axis? What's your gut tell you? If if both velocities are equal, I guess it would be at 45 degree angle. And then depending on which velocity is bigger is which way, right? Close, but not quite right. Okay. Doesn't it depend on the masses? Okay. I'm gonna say it this way. It depends on the momentum. So whichever one's momentum is bigger, it's not just the mass. It's not just the speeds. It's the mass speed combination. It's momentum which determines who wins, so to speak. The object which has more initial momentum will dominate and the angle will be closer to that axis. So if the truck, even though the truck's got more mass, what if the car was going 100 miles per hour and the truck was going 10 miles per hour. Even if the truck weighs twice as much, the car would dominate. You could think of this as well as bullets and your body. Bullets can be moving so much faster than your body, they can dominate and win and kill you. So we have to be careful. So, all right, in this case, I have no idea. That's my answer is I have no idea, but whichever one has more momentum would win. If you care, we could look at one of the parts right here. I know this one's 825, the other one's 640. Gosh, I still can't tell. I got to go to the calculator. I think the 600 is going to win, right? But I'm going to punch them in. Go ahead. Whoops. Just punch in the numbers for momentum, right? Mass times V. Which one's got a bigger MV? 800 times 25 versus... What was it, 600 times 40? So it looks like the vertical is gonna be slightly larger. So in this particular one, we have numbers. Normally you'd just be like, who cares? Just draw the damn thing and figure out the angle later. I think it should be slightly more than a 45, okay? So notice in this case, we could call this V final X. We could call this V final Y. And notice V final X, if I call that angle phi, sorry, let me get this a little closer in case the writing's small. Sorry about that. All right? In this case, V final X would be V final cosine phi. And V final Y should equal uh, V final sine phi. Standard split things into vectors. At this point, um, I'm going to just double check. This is positive because up. This is positive because right. Both of these are in the positive direction. Everything's positive. I don't have to worry about minus signs in this problem. All right. So as I keep going here, now I could say P initial equals P final. That's always true. Momentum is conserved in this collision. Now, wait, wait, wait. Are external forces negligible? Yeah. Again, this is a top view. We're looking at two cars driving on a flat road, okay, a car and a truck. So in this case, the normal force, which would be out of the page, is balanced by the gravitational force going into the page. So we don't have to worry about N and MG. The collision is short. We're going to ignore the friction during the collision because it happens so quickly. So this is good. This is a vector equation. I can rewrite this in two ways. P initial X equals P final X. On these, everything is going to be an I hat. Anything to the left would get a minus sign. Anything to the right would be plus. I could do P initial Y equals P final Y. And then from this point, 
I could say, all right, I've got M1, V1 initial X, plus 2 doesn't have any in the X, so I'm not even going to write it, equals mass 1 plus mass 2, that's the total mass, they stick together in this problem, times uh, V final cosine phi. I know this number, I know this number, I know these two numbers. In theory, I could also get this if I wanted to. I could just get V final X as well. Whoops. I could get V final X as well, right? Similarly, I could write another equation for the Y direction. Only in the Y direction, two is there, but one is not. One has no momentum in the Y direction. So you could have something like this. Sorry, I'm running out of room. Again, there's no one in the Y. In this particular problem, the two stick together, so that's why this is okay. And then I could say V final Y here. And again, I could also write it as V final sine of phi. Now, in this particular problem, I don't know what V final is, so it might make sense to actually use V final X, V final Y, square them and add them together, or take the inverse tangent, and I can get the angle, I can get the speed, whatever. Does that make sense? I'm kind of going a little faster now. Let me show you this. Let's go look at the solution and just kind of follow it through and you can sketch out the details later. The idea is we could get this, we can get the final speed, we could plug in these numbers. So we should be able to get this number and this number because we can get V final X and V final Y. That's what I was just showing you. Now, once we get that, notice this is a side view. These ones up here are top view as a, you're a drone up above spying on them. Then you're looking here from the side view. They hit, they collide, and they come to rest. What type of problem is this down here? Is that a momentum problem? It's an energy problem. Exactly. We see there is a common pattern here. Oftentimes, what we do in these situations is we use momentum during a collision. Sometimes 1D, sometimes 2D, sometimes elastic, so, but whatever. During the collisions, we use momentum. Afterwards, when it's one block sliding around, we use E initial plus work done equals E final. That chapter eight stuff we use in half of the problems in chapter nine. All right, so you got to know it pretty well. It all built, and then you could even do kinematics, you could do forces, you could do all kinds of stuff. So notice to get the work done in this case, we'd have to get the work done by friction. So you'd have to do an FBD, right? It's all there. Everything we've been doing all semester in every problem. You could plot the motion. You could use video capture like we just saw and kinematics to figure out blah, 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 blah. It's all tied together. What do you think? So if we pop cool. in there. Yeah, it, I think it's cool. Whoops, that's the wrong chapter. I, I think it's neat, but maybe I'm insane too, right? So, but they're not mutually, they're not mutually exclusive. There's the bullet going through there. Uh, whoops, which problem was this one? Oh yeah, this is our first 2D. So you can see I worked this all out in here. You can see I did all the inverse tangent. I got the numbers for you. I explained the work energy problem and then blah, 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 blah. We could get the, think about this. What is the practical application of this crap? Or is this completely worthless? Can anyone think of a practical application for this? To simulate car crashes? Okay. Mm, yeah, that's true. You could simulate. That's true. 
I was going to say, let's say you're an insurance company. You go to the scene of an accident. You measure the skid marks. You could find out how fast the driver was moving, find out they were speeding, and then not pay the claim. That's what insurance companies could do. This is forensics, or right? You could give people a ticket after the fact based off which angle the car slid after the collision and blah, blah. So I know this seems a little bit crazy, but this is forensics. You're analyzing a crime scene based off evidence left at the scene of the crime. How far did the car slide? In which angle? What were the, right? And you could use video capture technology from nearby stoplights or whatever. You could do all kinds of weird junk and get pieces of data and piece together stuff and refute claims uh, in court of law or insurance and things like that. That's where I'm going with this. Believe it or not, one time I fought a speeding ticket by using Google Earth and doing kinematics. And I said, this cop could not have seen me drive into that intersection and there's no way they know what I was doing. And I got out of the ticket. Now, I, I had stopped and then I went into the intersection, saw somebody and I stopped again. And then when I restarted, the cop had come around the corner and saw me. So they thought that I had just blown through the intersection, which I had not. And I'm like, are you kidding? I've got to get to class right now. And they said, fine, take the ticket and fight it in court of law. So I did. And I used Google Earth. All right. It was pretty funny. It's like, like one it's pretty time. Cool. Yeah, yeah, you could. I fought the law, man. Anyways, <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's get I feel back. Like you to, didn't expect that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Physics teacher. Yeah, well, him. it was actually a female cop. She didn't. Yeah, so she didn't expect that, but whatever. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Who cares? All right, so here's one with two D. Uh, here's a. Cl if you've never tried this before, if you have a basketball and a tennis ball, try this. Make sure you get an extremely overinflated basketball. The basketball is approximately three times the mass of a tennis ball. When you drop these two, this is really, really cool. What happens is if the basketball hits first and it's really overinflated, it's going to reverse direction like this. The tennis ball will essentially still be going down. And when you do this problem, it turns out this is another weird case, similar to what Esteban was asking about earlier. This one stops. And this one gets twice its initial velocity due to the math. It's just, this is a variation. It's not just pool balls where one of the balls stops. So here they're both moving down. The basketball reverses direction. The tennis ball right above it slams into it. If the collision is elastic, that's a big if, you could actually get the tennis ball to bounce up four times higher. If you recall, we know that V equals square root of two GH. So that means H is something like, uh, flip that around. What is that? V squared over 2G if I didn't screw it up in my head. So if you double the speed, you could actually drop a tennis ball from one meter and it'll go four meters up. What we used to do in the science building when I was in college is there was a big square stairwell that went up four stories like this. And we would stand on floor one and we would take two perfectly sized super bouncy balls. One was uh, three times the mass of the other, and we would drop it over the edge, and then it would shoot up and hit the ceiling. And this actually worked. Now, keep in mind, what if you had any slight angle? It would shoot up and hit you in the eye or the face or something and just hurt like hell. So if you're going to do this, I didn't tell you to do this. I'm suggesting you don't do this in a four-story stairwell if you have two bouncy balls with one mass 3M and the other mass M and no one else is around. Got it? So you, you drop them at the same time? Like you literally stack them like this. What we would do is we would take a little knife and we would cut a little divot in the top. So the other one would literally sit right on top of it. And now, even though they're hitting at the same time, the physics ends up being exactly the same. You don't actually have one hit right before the other one. Like, so if I'm doing this with a basketball, right? You know how there's those grooves on the basketball that kind of look like, uh, I don't know if this looks right or not. I'm, I'm forgetting what a basketball looks like. Something like this. You could set one of them right in the groove like this and drop it. And again, the more the basketball is inflated, the more perfectly elastic the collision is, the better this works. If you do this with a tennis ball, the tennis ball will hit you in the face, but it's never that painful. All right. So um, 
normally we do this in class and we could easily get it to hit the ceiling and like the projector and every, I would damage all kinds of stuff. Back in the day when we taught in classrooms, I broke the sink. I broke, I've broken everything in that classroom. Oh, well, uh, yeah. If, if it was there at one point, I broke it. All right. Um, now we're getting close. We want to take a break before the, the quiz, right? Uh, what time does the quiz start? Does anybody, or the group activity, whatever it's called. Does anybody know what time that starts? 1.30, I believe. 1.30. Okay. So we got a couple more minutes and then we'll stop. All right. Um, now I know, now you probably heard about Newton's cradles. This is a fun one. Um, you can watch Google Newton's cradle online. We have a big one that we bring in. I always had a really challenge. Uh, so this is a, a there's, a, there's some details here. If you are really passionate about Newton cradles, that's cool. Here's my weird challenge for you today with Newton's cradles. All right, so one, two, three, four, five balls. You make them all out of steel. The collisions are perfectly elastic. And the idea is if you lift two balls on one side and then you smack into the bottom, afterwards you'll see two balls go up on the other side and three remain at rest. Or you could do two from one side and one from the other. So my challenge for you is to come up with a letter that you could put on each ball such that any combination of down balls still forms a word. For example, like this, spire. This was one I thought might work, spire. If I lift the S and the P, ire is still a word. If I lift just the, uh, if I lift the R and the E and the S, pi, that's still a word. But try and find one that makes a word no matter how many balls you lift up from either side. It's not very easy. Okay. Uh, I tried spine once. I don't think that worked. Right. Because I don't think I and E is a word. Anyways, you could go crazy with that. If you're into boggle and scrabble, you could play that game. All right. Next. Ooh. All right. 9.15. What type of problem does this look like? Is it an elastic collision? Is it a inelastic collision? Is it perfectly inelastic collision? How would you model this? It's just elastic, right? Yeah, and since the blocks are separating, I would call it an elastic explosion. If you're wondering about what an explosion problem might look like, here's a 1D. So let me ask you this. Let's, let's look at this one. 9.15. All three blocks are initially at rest. What's the initial momentum? Zero. Okay. And that's true in the X and Y, but okay, fine. What's the initial energy in this problem? Kx squared. One half Kx squared. You were actually right the first time. Why? Oh, because the halves cancel out? Yeah, because oh. you have two springs, so it's two times one half x squared. Or mm -hmm. what's, I said it wrong. One half kx. So we could find the initial energy. Now, in this case, we know p final has to equal p initial, right? So we could do a momentum problem. Because these springs conserve energy, we could also say e initial equals E final. Strictly speaking, how many equations do we have here? How many equations do we have here? In the strict mathematical sense. Is it uh, two equations? Four. X, Y, and Z, right? Because there's a P initial X, P initial Y. However, exactly what Dom said, these two are completely worthless, right? Because there's never any momentum in the Y or Z here. So really, there's only two useful equations, this one and that one. However, strictly speaking, there are four written there. Do you know what I'm saying, people? 
there's the I hat equation, the J hat equation, and the K hat equation. It just turns out the J hat equation says zero equals zero, not useful. The K hat equation says zero equals zero. So if you had to generalize this to a, a 2D or 3D, you just stick in the J hat and the K hat. It's the same crap. Okay, so energy is conserved in this case. Is momentum conserved? Yes. Is M2 going to travel anywhere? What do you think? No. Why not? Um, because it's the forces that on both sides are the same. Okay. However, which block is going to take longer to release from the spring? Which block is going to give more? This is one kilogram, and this is three kilograms. Oh, I didn't read that. So yeah. So now that you know that, which way is two going to move after the fact? To the left. Yeah. So this has also got minus signs in it. Now, do you agree? I think that was Dom talking there. Do you agree that the speed of two should be pretty small? This is a 10 yeah. kilogram block. It's a huge mass. So you're right. Yeah. Oh, okay, Nick. Thanks. I'll chat with you afterwards on that one. All right. So um, in this case, uh, um, we expect a small negative value for the final velocity of two. So we can get the speed. We expect it to be a small speed. So when you do this one, let's just take a second to look at it now. Um, then we got four minutes, so I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Ooh, there's a fun one. Ooh. Oh, here's, uh, by the way, uh, this problem right here shows you how to do the classic pool ball experiment if it's got an angle, okay? All right, whatever. Ooh, what is this note? Please, please, please. Oh, watch out. When you're doing these problems, this is a thing I see all the time. People write V1 initial X, and then they'll say like V1, and then they'll put in the trig function. Do not put it, write the subscript X and the trig function because then you're double counting angles and it drives me insane. All right, whatever. There's the basketball one. That basketball one is sneaky. Make sure you read this. A lot of people screw up the basketball one. Make sure you follow the solution. It's right here. There's a watch out, so watch out. Um, yeah, I'm going to let you check that basketball one later. All right, so this is what that one looks like. Uh, okay, so we get some momentum. We get some energy. It's a big mess. You plug in some, ugh. These are kind of a slog. So yeah, the final velocity was uh, a half a meter per second versus the other one, which was um, negative three. Oh, here's a case where you have to think about both roots and take the, oh man, this is a good problem. All right, whatever. I'm, I'm kind of giving you the highlights here. I hope this is helping. Here's a case where you have a bomb. It's an explosion. It's not elastic. We should gain energy. How much kinetic energy was added? All right. Um, ooh, this is a really good review question. I'm going to leave that for you. And then, oh, this is a fun one. Imagine those two hovercrafts where we were throwing, um, uh, those are aliens or something, right? So um, not zombies. This is very different, very different physics. Alien physics is totally different. But the, this was something I was wondering about, and maybe you're curious about it too. Say you have two people on a hovercraft. This one throws the ball. They recoil backwards. Now this one catches. When they catch it, they start moving backwards. Then let's say they try and throw it backwards. They're going to recoil. That ball is going to hit this person, and they're going to start going backwards even faster. My question was, how many throws could they do back and forth in deep space in their hovercraft before they're already moving faster than the ball. Does that make sense? So I was curious and I actually worked it out. So if you're crazy and this is driving you nuts, like it drove me nuts, you could wonder how often aliens play, could play catch in space with a medicine ball. If that's what keeps you up at night, read this. If that doesn't, don't read that. Uh, ooh. This is a good problem, 9.21. And we're, it's time to stop and take our break, but we're almost there. The, this, these three problems are all good. 21, 20. I hope I put those on your required list. Let me check. I don't know where my list is right now. Come on, people. Come on. 
whatever. Well, let's worry about it later. Let's take the break. Now, um, so that's that. So next week when we oh, wait, next week is spring break. So when we come back from spring break, I'm probably going to move into center of mass. But I think you have all the tools now to handle collisions and explosions. It's just a matter of doing the work. You can do it. So um, uh, I think you will find them very tedious at first. But if you do a few of them, you learn the algebra tricks. So it's pretty important that you do these and grind through the math and get fast at them. Otherwise, during a final exam, that problem, which should be fast and easy because it's simple algebra, could take you all day because you haven't practiced enough. And then you don't have time for the hard problems on the final. Okay, so you got to practice those. Um, now, when we come back, um, I may actually end up randomizing the groups today because I'm trying to make sure that not every person is in the same group every time. Just, I don't know, I want to mix it up a little bit. I'm not always going to do that to you. But uh, I have had some people say they want to kind of mix things up a little bit. So today I might go random on you with your groups. So, um, all right, go ahead and take your break. And then we'll be back at 1.30 and the quiz will be rolling or the group activity. And I'll get to.